listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White and joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, sir? I am happy to be here and you? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here as well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're, there's, a, there's a nut that needs to be cracked by manufacturing marketers, you know, that, uh, and I think it's, you know, there's no magic bullet. And um, uh, that's why I think today's conversation is, uh, is so interesting, because I do think it's a challenge that's going to persist for the next while. Like this for is, some time, yeah. It's a pattern that's going to be, uh, that they're going to be navigating, you know, easily for the next five plus years. I have to think so, and potentially even beyond. I mean, it, uh, and it's an issue that persists across, I think it, it kind of, it really sometimes makes the the job of marketers within a manufacturing organization that more difficult when the connectivity with sales and the the kind of uh, you know the the synchronization that needs to happen there that uh, perhaps best comes to life digitally um, isn't necessarily gelling. Yeah. <laughs> To put yeah. It let's uh, without further ado, let's jump into yeah. it. I think yeah. today's guest is going to uh, have some uh, some insight to offer. Absolutely. So joining us today is Mike McCormick. Mike is the VP of Marketing and Strategy at the Emerson Appleton Group. Welcome to the Cooler Ring, Mike. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Mike, it's uh, it's awesome to have you on the show. I, I wonder if we could start by getting a bit of an introduction to the Emerson Appleton Group. Uh, your your part within Emerson, I guess, so maybe that's a two phase intro, and then uh, we'll want to learn a bit more about you as well. Absolutely, um, Emerson is a you know Fortune two hundred um, automation company that is global in its reach and scope, focusing on helping largely industrial from all the way from discrete, hybrid, and process industries automate. Um, and uh, improve their operations within their facility. Everything from control systems to valves to pneumatic automation, um, actuation, and then Appleton's group part in that is on the electrical space. So we're about providing electrical material largely to harsh, hazardous, or otherwise areas that need a higher level of safety for operators as well as safety for electrical equipment itself. Um, Appleton is also a global company um, that's part of the discrete automation part of Emerson um, that does focus in on that uh, that electrical safety and reliability within those harsh and hazardous environments. Very cool. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's funny because we're talking today about of the challenge of navigating the transition from traditional to digital when you serve a market that frankly isn't in front of a computer all day every day and in some way it feels to me like that challenge might even be more difficult because part of what you're doing at emerson appleton group is marketing more technologically advanced progressive solutions so there's a real desire probably to, to, to walk the talk. Absolutely, yes. As, as Emerson and Appleton continue to move into those more automation products and um, more technologically sophisticated products, the need to have that marketing and that training material, you know, as point of use becomes more crucial. And it is definitely a challenge when your user bases and that point of use are often in remote parts of the world, remote parts of the country, as well as just in parts that don't have connectivity for a variety of reasons, including, you know, IT security and um, and just cybersecurity reasons to not have that general connectivity inside of a refinery, for instance, or a power plant and other critical sites. Uh, that's an important distinction, too, because, you know, so often these conversations kind of start and stop around the you know transition, um, kind of the uh, the aging of the workforce, the graying of the workforce, and the new new folks coming in with different preferences. But beyond that dynamic, you're saying this is just an environmental situational one too. 
Yes, yes, it is. It is. And a lot of the existing industrial facilities in, in the, across the globe um, have very restrictive policies on bringing in any kind of electronic equipment, especially ones that can communicate and have, you know, understanding what all of those requirements are that can vary from company to company, jurisdiction by jurisdiction is important for marketers to understand, not just on your product development side, but also on how you're going to reach and communicate to customers. Mike, on that front, I mean, if we're talking about, you know, physically isolated plants, also knowing that, you know, buying groups, uh, as, as we all know, in this kind of manufacturing space are, are larger and larger, how much of a uh, role do the folks within those types of facilities, within those types of roles play in a broader buying arrangement? Um, so, I mean, you, usually at the point of use, those people, especially for technologically sophisticated products, and that ones that are connected themselves or the ones that require, you know, an engineer's level of decision making. It's the plant people, the people who spend the majority of their days in, you know, fireproof suits out in the plants or otherwise out, out in those, those hazardous locations. They're the ones making the buying decisions. The purchasing people who are usually behind a computer all day for some of the more, you know, basic commodity level products, they, they'll make that decision on, on those pieces. But at the end, the purchasing folks who cuts the PO is going to rely on that engineer out in the field um, for what they need to buy down to the exact manufacturer and specification, because it is so crucial to have the right equipment that works with the broader system out at the plant. And you painted such a you know, vivid picture there. I mean, we, you're down to the suit that the person's wearing and you can almost like I can visualize that being making it difficult to use technology, let alone not having access to it anyway. How are you? What are you doing? I mean, how are you? How how are you operating in this space? How are you breaking through? How are you standing out when um, you know some of the tools that most marketers think of these days might not be available? So I mean, I think it starts with ensuring you have the right voice of the customer that. You're talking to those people who you are trying to communicate to. And in this instance, talking to them is usually in person or at lunch or when you can have some of their time outside of the facility to truly understand how they're doing their jobs every day. The best thing I can do is have my marketing communications people and my marketers out watching their behavior when they're out in the field to understand what do, what tools do they actually use and can use out in the field? And then ask those follow-up questions about how are they connecting to whatever they're doing? How are they getting that information? And in some cases, some of the, the older workforce are definitely pulling out lots and lots of pieces of paper and they're going back to their offices or asking other people to print things out for them. So that's one area you have to make sure you, you can reach and make sure you have printable pieces in those cases. But those that do use digital tools, and those are becoming more and more common, you need to understand and make sure your content is um, consumable on these devices. Some areas have lower bandwidth restraints because they have an isolated network that's behind a firewall that doesn't have 5G or doesn't have, you know, the internet speed we're all used to in our, our uh, environment. So it, like in an office environment, so you want to make sure you have material that's able to be easily pulled up. That's low megabyte, low, you know, just <clears throat> low, low size. Um, and then you want to make sure that for um, that it formats correctly on some of the tools that they use. So some of these hazardous environments have specific tablets that are actually intrinsically safe that are allowed to be out in a potentially explosive uh, atmosphere. And those things don't have all the, the features and functionality of your standard iPad or, or Android tablet that you're looking at. So you want to make sure your material is optimized for those devices when, when your, your user base are using those um, at the point of decision making. I love that. And Carmen knows that I love this stuff. Anytime you get into the design of something with these unique limitations that uh, really get to the heart of a specific user need, 
you know, that's that's a special level of understanding of what you need to create and how you need to deliver it. You know, that that medium is inherently different than all the marketing automated platforms that that so many marketers get to enjoy, you know, when you're kind of constricted by these uh, these rules and formats and and specific things. So uh, hats off for kind of digging into that and, and truly beginning to understand it because it's it's not a common thing to to look at it to that level. No, when, when you have a, a niche customer base, there aren't, um, you know, academic journals or other research that's readily available that you can Google and, and download and understand what best practices are. You have to, you know, understand the broader market's best practices, but then talk with your customers directly to understand how they 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 want to be communicated with and then format so to make sure you're you're there for for their needs and you know it, uh, this just would, would impact content type as well i mean my guess is that you can't rely much on video because obviously of size restrictions i mean yes you can make lower res better streaming video or what have you but um uh, do you find it, it does t tend to default a bit more to to written communication? Um, it it does. Um, you, you need to default to written communication, including ensuring you have the right written communication that has the relevant information they need at each point in their kind of their decision cycle. Video content is crucially important when you're introducing a brand new technology. That's not something that someone is going to, make a decision on while well, they're out in the field. That's something within the office time. They want to know and understand what you're doing there. But when you are at the point of implementation or at the point of replacing an existing thing, you need to have that written communication and in a, you know, a consumable format, preferably kind of one page, one screen-esque format that is easy for them to access and see everything they need. Because when they're in those fire suits with gloves and everything, they're not you know, na they don't need to want to navigate through eight screens to go find what they need. Kind of got to be as accessible as possible. I'd be curious, um, as, you, as you and the marketing team have kind of gotten closer to customers and explored that kind of voice of customer research, uh, beyond the device, the, the unique devices, uh, any other surprises, anything, kind of assumptions that you carried into that that ended up being wrong? Um, you know, I think some of the assumptions that we had is that everybody does prefer digital communication. Um, and when you actually get out and talk to customers, you understand that written physical materials are actually still important in some use cases, because some people have precisely zero connectivity out in the field, either by um, that they don't have the investment dollars to build out that connectivity infrastructure, or because of rules within their facility, nuclear power plants, for instance, you know, you're, 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 you need quite the lengthy approval to get something into that facility. Um, you know, but paper is generally allowed. Um, so making sure that you really know your customer and what you need to do to talk to them, I think, and not just sort of assume the feedback you get digitally represents your entire customer base because you're not getting feedback digitally from those customers who are not digital enabled themselves. Now, I'm taking a bit of liberties here. <laughs> Wouldn't be the um, first time. <laughs> but I think uh, to, uh, to say it's the, the defining strategy would be the, the taking the liberties part. But I do think it, there's something kind of charming or interesting about a Fortune 200 company, serious global brand, having the a bit of the guiding uh, North Star to say, we want to provide the best paper-based communications in our industry. Like nobody would be thinking that in 2023, but I, I don't, I don't lead with that when I talk with our CEO <laughs> and everything about our strategy. Um, but but ensuring you have the right communication for your audience. I think is what's important um, and not just assuming that um, that that everyone works in the same environment that, that we work in. Yeah, that self-reference criteria is a, a pillar for marketers. <laughs> Mike, how much uh, 
you know, we all, I think as marketers these days, we all try to make the effort to create once and distribute and repurpose as many times as possible. How much of that comes into play when you're, you know, creating digital properties for things that you then need to distill down to uh, one pager printable materials? No, that's a, a really good point. And that, that tends to be the crux of, of most of the, you know, ongoing discussions within, within our organization is we, like every other organization, have limited budget, limited time, limited resources to create everything. So we can't do everything we want to do um, across the board to reach, to, to satisfy every customer need that we've discovered. So we have constant kind of prioritization discussions to say for this type of material, for a brand new technology, major product launch piece, we're going to we're going to try and blanket it and have everything for everybody. But then for different pieces, for different ongoing communications, we make we, we narrow that down and we try and you know, follow the 80 20 rule and say, all right, these, you know, five materials will cover 80% of our customer use cases. And some people, yep, they might have to, to go to a printer or they might have to um, you know, wait until they're in the office to access this. Or in some cases, they may not ever see it at all, but you know, you cannot do everything for everybody. So trying to make sure we, we are hitting the right prioritization is, is crucial. And one assumes the multilingual nature of things, given the fact that you're a global business, doesn't make this less complicated. It does not. No, no. And that's where, where digital shines is in multi nature, you know, with AI translations and data banks of, of everything. It makes it far easier and faster and cheaper to have digital translations um, outside of outside of your native language. Um, so when you get to the paper translations, that, that makes that prioritization and budget even more important. And, and you know, including on which languages and markets we're going to tackle and what pieces we're going to have available. So you kind of look at some kind of Maslow's marketing hierarchy of needs of, <laughs> all right, I'll have a catalog page. I'll have the real basic stuff physically and digitally in lots of languages. But, yep, your, your you know, fancy automated animated, you know, video that you want playing, well, that might only be in our top two or three languages. How far does this requirement to service the more offline um, customers go, you know, is it right through to the order stage as, as well as kind of that, that early, that early identification journey where you're, you're trying to get people aware of, of the new products and things like that. Like, you know, so, how, how does it go through to sales? So it, well, just during, um, or, uh, just during COVID, we actually finally stopped taking faxed in orders. So um, we did stop taking handwritten orders uh, recently. Um, so the order stage is is actually is, is still digital. So we make sure we have those tools available to people to order digitally. But the specifying and the the designate that I want Appleton's part ABC um, for our for our best customer base, we try and make sure that that's available, you know, across the spectrum so that they can easily communicate, hey, I need this, this Appleton widget. And here's the part number to the procurement person who's behind, behind a desk. And it does stand to reason that you could tolerate a bit more friction on the, or at the order, time of order, people have already made a decision You kind of force them down the digital route a bit more. Whereas in specifying, uh, your friction elimination desires are even higher. Absolutely, because if you, if if on the specified form it's your part number, you you're you're getting you're getting ninety percent of those orders. That's where the battle's truly won or lost, and you're getting the price that you need. You're not trying to come in late and change a decision based upon pricing or some other reason later on, where you're never successful right that's a really that, that's really helpful guidance as people are looking at okay what part of the parts of this process can i maybe nudge my customers towards a, a more digitally centric uh, motion and um you know starting with orders maybe uh keeping specifying a bit more omni 
uh, omni delivery uh, is a good. I idea. think one of the things that's is also perhaps worth exploring here is you know we we talked a bit about a, a graying workforce on you know on the purchasing side of things and probably on the on the sales side of things as well. I mean we don't want to be ageist about it, but it, it is a fact of the manufacturing space currently that you know we're, we're trying to get more and more young people into it, but it's not necessarily. Um, moving as quickly as many, many would like, but are you finding on the other end that some of the newer entrants into the field are 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 pushing back against uh, against the paper and, and trying to uh, to get better access, or is it just that the the environments are so restricted and locked down that's not possible? No, absolutely. The the younger workforce, those who, who have you know been digital for their purchasing information consumption needs their whole lives or their, their adult lives, um, are definitely pushing their own companies to be able to do this because they, they know and see the efficiencies that would come from that piece, from the ability to cut down on errors, just even on, you know, we've seen them when someone misinterprets a handwritten, you know, uh, SKU number written down and they order the wrong thing. That, that could cause thousands of dollars and, and more importantly, you know, weeks of, of uh, downtime or some kind of mistake in, in a plant there when they're ordering the wrong thing. And having that, that digital piece available is how they want to work. And so they're pushing their own companies to think outside the box, to think about how they can set up their own, their own private networks, still have the industrial security that they need, but they're able to access this digitally because they also know that more and more information is only available digitally because manufacturers and uh, suppliers can only afford in some cases to produce one. And you're going to produce the one that is easily distributable globally um, when you are making that, when you are forced to make that choice. So understanding who those voices are in the customer base and what they're pushing and then what, where they think their company is going to allow um, that space in the future? Is it using more secure communication technologies? Is it using more cellular so it's isolated from um, from the, the plant infrastructure, you know, fiber network? Um, understanding where you think that's going to go is important so that when we're investing and thinking about prioritization, we're building content that is consumable by, by the, the majority of the people going forward rather than just the people who are going to retire. Spray some Windex on the crystal ball a little bit, because <laughs> um, uh, I mean it's interesting to talk about this uh, as uh, from a, a push pull dynamic. Like one of it is uh, as the buying um, uh, that that generation of buyers kind of changes out, they're going to be pushing their organizations for that connectivity. So that kind of leads me to believe a little bit that the end might be in sight, and we could go more fully digital at some point in the near future but then at the same time you know you mentioned nuclear energy as an example that's a that's an industry that does, that does not move fast and does not adopt to do things quickly no no um so i, I guess um if you had to guess do you, do you see a time on the horizon when you think you'll be able to be fully digital um I do. I do believe that the future will be fully digital, um, like it is in, in other industries that, um, you know, are, are farther along the technology curve and don't have some of the same limitations. But I definitely think it's it's beyond a five year time horizon. I'm thinking it's, it's somewhere in the five to 10 year range that we could get fully digital. Um, but each year we're making sure we're reassessing and understanding where we're at. And each year we're we're producing less and less pieces um, for the physical media and more and more as a percentage of what we do in the digital pieces. So I, I suspect within five years that that percent that's physical is going to get very low. As you uh, assess your buyers, I'm, I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but there is something you said earlier that has had me thinking. Uh, you, you mentioned around say, a new product introduction or solving a new problem or solving an old problem in a new way. That's the kind of uh, area where people would potentially would be doing the research at the desktop. That's where video is going to come in handy and things of that sort. Um, it, how I, I'm I'm assuming that that's not everybody, but what, I guess do we have an understanding of the percentage of those tough to reach uh, 
on the ground, on the production line, buyers that actually do have some office time, do have some of that research time? Do you have a sense of what that percentage looks like? Oh, I think I think 100% of those hard to reach people do have some office time. I mean, they, they all have email addresses like every single one of us and they're accountable to their bosses and have to fill out expense reports. Um, I, I mean, I believe some of them are in the, you know, the five to 10% of their time that's behind a desk. Others, depending on their role and everything can be, you know, 30 or 40% of their time behind the desk. Um, so when you're trying to reach those people who are, majority of their time out in the field and they only have five to 10% out. You do want to make sure you have content that is brief and to the point, because if you're, if you're, if you're having your half an office day and you've got your email inbox to go through and an expense report to fill out and everything else you need to do for your day job, you want to make sure you have content that can be impactful, quick um, and insightful to reach them to think about, all right, my next time, you know, when I'm behind a desk, I, I need to, save an hour to research this new technology or do this type of thing too. In those cases where you have people who are still consuming the paper side of things, are you attempting at all to do any sort of attribution? Um, it, it, uh, no, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about consumption, which in our case is delivery of that paper material out there. We know X amount got out to these locations as to how much it's being actually, you know, attributed, it's it's a it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I, I, it's refreshing to hear you say it like that. To be honest, I was, you know, it, it would have been a guess. You know, if you were trying to say, well, you know, we think this uh, contributed to this percentage of, uh, you know, <laughs> the buyers. I, th- I think you should do it like the old days of the community newspapers where they tried to suggest that every weekly newspaper was read an average of 20 people. <laughs> like, <laughs> how? How? <laughs> yeah, I, I, could, I could spend all day trying to make assumptions on that, but I don't think that that's, that's really going to lead to any in, in, insights. So it's more about having those conversations, trusting that it, it is being consumed and driving business, measuring your overall success rate as a business, but then continuing to listen to when you think we can actually continue to tr- make that digital transition and relieve ourselves of that expense uh, in both time and, uh, and budgetary dollars on that physical medium. Mike, I want to um, change gears a little bit as we close out the show and, uh, it's going to be that time of year. We're not. I don't want to wish our year away yet, but you know we are starting to look ahead and plan for next year. And people are thinking about their twenty twenty four, et cetera. What are you most looking forward to? What do you think is going to be most uh, the the biggest change uh, in twenty twenty four for marketers? Um, as I sit and think about about you know what we're looking forward for the next you know year or so. Um, what, what we're really trying to focus in on from listening to our customers that we hadn't been quite as um, quite as attuned to in the, in the past couple of years is ensuring we have the right um, length of material and the right piece of marketing content that can kind of fit in um, to enable conversations with sales organizations with, with the, the end customers piece. So to ensure we can be more customizable in what we provide. So having, and this this does lend itself to the digital piece, um, but ensuring we have the ability to customize conversations or have our sales team customize conversations for their, their for their specific customer needs because they are so for, for, uh, you know varied and uh, and diverse. So that's that's one of the areas we're looking at focusing on on twenty four, and we've. Um, we brought in some uh, some people from from outside industries, from not industrial space, to help us uh, think about how to do that a little bit better than what we've done in the past here at Emerson. Mike, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's been uh, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash the cooler ring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring.